It is Blood and Guts. And it is the Blackpool Combat Club. Okay, here you go. Hold and on, friends. A shot at the Young Bucks, the best tag team in the world. Boys, you can get a shot at us this Friday on Rampage. Oh, good idea. However, you're not going to just get a shot at the titles. No, 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 no. You're going to have to beat us one time first to prove who the heck you are. We, we know who you are in Japan, but let's show the American audience, the AEW audience, that you're the superstars that you claim to be. <laughs> and if you don't win us, Yoshihashi mm. and go to Win us. You two could go straight to hell. Go straight to you, hell. You the play on words. Right. And I never thought I'd say this. I kind of miss Brandon. Fred's doing all right, though, man. So instead of saying you can go to hell, he said you can go straight to hell. Yes. And then he said, get it? Go to? <laughs> no, you fucked it up. Which actually made it funnier. Yeah. They are great. Blood and Guts, the Blackpool Combat Club and Friends versus the Jericho Appreciation Society. So, as noted, this went 40 plus minutes. There was a lot of chaos. 12 men, even with two rings, is impossible to keep track of what's going on. Uh, do we want to go like segment by segment in detail? It's going yes. To be All right. Kidding me? All right, so Claudio Castagnoli starts with Sammy Guevara. The very first spot they do, something went wrong. Yes. But it was funny because as I'm watching this, it's like, there was a lot of stuff in this match that wasn't smooth. Yes. But it's fucking blood and guts, bro. Yeah. And it kind of all is. worked out in the end. The extra chaos helped it. Uh, you don't want this match to be pretty. I found myself way too often thinking, what just happened? Who was that person? Well, yeah, right. there's that happening. Yeah, there's, there's 12 guys in the ring, dude. Yeah. So, yes, the first they tried to do something where, like, they would do a stare down from opposite rings and charge and, like... I think the idea was Claudio would go through a spear through the ropes, but Sammy would clear over the ropes. They just end up in opposite rings again. Whatever happened, they went bonk. And so Claudio said, fuck this. And he just threw Sammy high into the sky and he went off from there. And uh, first segment was mostly Claudio was killing him to death until Daniel Garcia, Daniel Garcia came in. I do want to mention this. I forgot to say this on Sunday because he had a cameo at the end of the, uh, of the Forbidden Door pay-per-view. But uh, Daniel Garcia was at Forbidden Door on Sunday. Saturday night, he was in Seattle for Defy Wrestling, and his match against Trey Miguel was awesome. It was the best match of the night, and Garcia was the star of the night. That guy rules, and as, as great as he is on Dynamite and Rampage, and I think we all agree he's pretty great in this show, he's even greater in person when he's allowed to do... When he's allowed to be the man, and he was the man at Defy, and it was great. So, it's two on one. Sammy and Daniel against Claudio. We go to commercial. We come back. Wheeler Yuta hits the ring. A lot of suplexes. A lot of suplex uppercut combos. Jake Hager is the next man in for Jericho's team. So it's three on two. And it's briefly a fair fight between himself and Claudio because we get some Haas warfare in there. But eventually the numbers game catches up. They were doing three minute intervals, by the way, which I was unsure of because the old classic 1980s working match matches always did two minutes. It was a perfect amount of time. NXT always has three minutes, which is too much time. It's just, you're waiting for the next guy to come in. So they, when they announced three minutes, I thought it would be too much time. But they made good use of the three minutes every time. They had something going on beyond just guys doing moves for three minutes. There was some kind of story going on. And here it was, Jake Hager and Claudio going Haas versus Haas for a few minutes. John Moxley comes in to make it three on three. He brings a chair with him, a fork. Later we would see skewers. He was basically wearing... Tactical gear. Yeah, where the fuck? Why did, why did anyone else bring gimmicks into the ring? Was, yeah, this guy have, was the only guy who was prepared. He had more pockets than cable and more weapons, too. And just using all of them. Brought his bag of blades. He did, actually. <laughs> passing them out like candy. So, he's I don't running... think he was passing them out, dude. Yeah. I think he was responsible for cutting everybody in this match. Well, whoever it, was responsible. It sure fucking looked like... Because he used... Uh, I think the first guy was... Uh, might have been, uh, I can't remember who it was, but I think when Matt, because he took the... Is, is it uh, Ange or Daddy Matt? Cool hand Ange or Daddy Magic. It was, well, I know Matt, he stuck the sticks in his head. Yeah. And then he went to work on him. So I think he cut him. Hmm. He cut himself. I think he cut Garcia, but I'm not sure. Gar Garcia was I first. seem to remember that he, he might have got Garcia first. So I think he cut, he's like Mox the Ripper in this match here. Might have been. Might have been. So he's destroying everyone and making him, and uh, yeah, Garcia got forked. He was the first one to bleed. So it's three on three, but it's a dominant three on three. And so by the end, they're hitting triple team moves. So when Cool Hand Ange comes in to make it four on three, it's actually one on three, and he's the one. 
<laughs> All his friends are dead. So he has to play keep away for several minutes until his friends can rally. And they can finally get the numbers on their edge. The uh, numbers on their side. So that was a fun thing to do. Uh, let's see. Eventually, Ortiz is the next man in. And he has to fight his way into the cage. But he takes over. We go to the commercial. There's still a half hour in the show to go. Daddy, Daddy Magic comes in. I've lost track of numbers at this point. I guess it would have been five on four right then. He's got a chair with him. During the commercial break, shards of glass were brought into the ring. Everyone's bleeding everywhere. Like, legit, I don't know if I've ever seen a bloodier pro wrestler than Cool Hand Ange in this match. He was slaughtered. He was shredded. So, Santana comes in. He brings a table and a barbed wire bat into the ring. And he runs wild for about 20 seconds and then does a backbreaker and appears to blow out his knee. That I sucks. think it was just a urinage. I don't even think he dropped him over his knee. Uh, that sucks more than I think he just hit a urinage and his and his knee went out and mm. just uh they presume he destroyed like every ligament in his leg. That sucks. So it's gonna be a long, long time. Yeah. Which is kind of interesting because I was I was given the impression that uh that their deals are coming up in the fall. Oh. And uh, it'll be interesting to see, because if this were WWE, his contract would be frozen until he comes back. Uh So it'll be interesting to see what AEW does. Like, when his deal is up, I mean, is he going to be just free, even though he's been injured for, uh, you know, five months or whatever? Or or will they freeze his contract? We're going to... This will be interesting, because we're going to find out what they do with injured folks. Okay. Yeah, and and I don't know, honestly, if he found a way to get him out of the ring or if he just laid... No, he laid on the... He was in there the whole time. The whole time. Okay, that's what I thought. Because he did a spot later. He did, like, one spot where he, like, hit somebody, and then he fell down and he just laid there for the entire rest of the match. And they did everything they could to not shoot him. If you say so, because this was the point where I lost track of what was going on. Um, There was was only, only, I say, 10 guys in the ring, but... This is where there'd be two guys doing a move, and I couldn't tell who it was. And all of Jericho's guys were wearing red and bleeding, and it was all going lightning fast. So Moxley has skewers for Daddy Magic. Wheeler Yuta and Daniel Garcia were having a slap fight. I knew I knew it was them just because of where they had been when the camera cut. I could hear the slap fight. I could not see it. It was on a camera, but they were wailing on each other. Uh, cool Hand Ange used the cameraman as a weapon. That was great. Chris Jericho was in there with Floyd. Everyone's doing stuff. I've missed half of it. I have no idea what's going on. But in the end, somehow, at the end of the three minutes, Jericho was the only one standing. Perfect timing as Eddie Kingston hits the ring and Blood and Guts officially begins. So we had Eddie Kingston with his kendo stick. <laughs> like Darth Vader at the end of Rogue One. Just slicing guys left yes. and right to get to Jericho. So Eddie had a bottle of rubbing alcohol with him. And then when I think Hager hit him from behind, the bottom went flying. Somehow it flew on accident from inside the ring to outside the cage, but then they couldn't get it back into the cage on purpose. And Ty is trying to push it through the fence. I think eventually they got it in there. I'm not even sure. There's a table in there. Hager's power bombed through it. They begin to tear one ring apart. The other one's littered with tacks, thumbtacks everywhere. Daddy Magic just takes a throwaway suplex into the thumbtacks. I bet that sucked. Uh, somehow, no idea how. No idea who did it. Cool Hand Ange is removed from the inside of the cage, placed on the outside of the cage. How in the fuck did he get there? But he's hanging upside down, yes. bleeding out like a side of beef. But he's hanging upside down on the outside. Like, I don't... How did he get out there to be hung upside down? Well, it would be nice to tell you, but there was too much chaos going on. Well, I think that, uh, I mean, there's not... I assume it wasn't voluntary. Sure, but there's, there's not much you can do when you're... There's all this stuff going on, and I mean, unless you want to do the WWE thing, do like 85 camera cuts, so you can you can see everything, but you actually can't, which is ironic. Well, the one thing, but what would be better for sure is if we could have watched this on fight, because I don't care how picture in picture, or whatever. It's too small. I can't see what's going on. I hate picture in picture. There was a lot of stuff that happened during picture in picture. Having the commercial breaks did ruin the flow of the match. Yes, and and it, this were much but better. But you must on pay the bills on paper. It must. It must. It's 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 the way it goes. The, this would have been much better on a pay per view. That is true. We come back from the break. Jericho is dragging Moxley through the tacks and putting him on the walls of Jericho. Eddie saves by throwing tacks in Jericho's face. There's blood on the camera, which is the sign of a quality match every single time. Uh, fire extinguishers in there. Ty Conti's interfering. Ruby Soho runs out to attack Ty Conti. 
God, can you imagine being dragged through fucking thumbtacks? I bet it sucks. I mean, it's one thing to take a bump on the thumbtacks. And uh, we have had people on Observer Live. I forget who it was. But uh, somebody explained to me that, you know, believe it or not, don't want to break kayfabe here, but it actually doesn't hurt that bad to take a bump on a thumbtacks. Mm-hmm. And uh, imagine if we, like, fell. If you fell on sticker bushes, you just, like, fell on them. That's not a big deal. But getting pulled through sticker bushes. Yes. Moxie's getting dragged. And he has a shirt on, but still, he's getting dragged through these fucking thumb. And he's screaming. Oh, yeah. And uh, Moxie doesn't sell, you know, <laughs> like that. Like that. Yeah. But boy, he was screaming on that one. So the interference of the women somehow leads to the door being open. And it's just like uh, Sean the Undertaker. The door is open. The cowardly heel is trying to flee. And Jericho scurries up the top as fast as he can. And Eddie Kingston, who would be the Undertaker in this scenario, is very happy to see this, because now Chris is trapped. <laughs> so they go up there. And I, I know they were on the roof last time with, uh, it was MJF and, and, and Jericho. Uh, so it was probably like this before, but I had forgotten just how sturdy the roof is in the a- AEW Blood and Guts cage. Good. Yeah, I'm not, not complaining, but no one is going through this thing. So Eddie drops Jericho with a back fist up on top of the roof. <laughs> Hey. Eddie and Jericho are up on this cage, and uh, I don't want to. I don't want to put words into their mouth. I don't want to say they're afraid of heights, okay? But I mean, they were careful. Uh, they were getting low, <laughs> and they weren't going really fast. Low, low center of gravity. <laughs> and- but motherfucker, this Cesaro, this uh, Claudio Castagnoli, he gets on this fucking cage, and this guy ain't scared of heights at all. I mean, at one point. You know, he does his his thing. He fucking runs. He sprints across the top of this cage to the other side of the cage so he can, like, do it to the the, the fans over there. And it ain't slow. He's running. Yes. And uh, the big spot, obviously, is uh, he grabs Chris Jericho and he gives him the giant swing on top of the cage. Now, I fucking hate heights, okay? Mostly... Because when I'm on something high, I have this like weird feeling that fuck I may jump. It's weird, and uh, so I don't. I, I I I I hate being up high on anything, and I hate seeing anybody up high. And a lot of guys were climbing this cage, and I don't know what it was, but like the last step to get up it seemed to be difficult for everybody. So my fucking heart's just like thumping, and. Claudio grabs Jericho, and I'm like, you ain't going to fucking swing this guy in this cage. You're out of your fucking mind, dude. And he grabs Jericho, and he starts doing this spin. And I was like, I was dying. I was fucking scared shitless to see this guy being swung on top of that cage. And, you know, I watched it live, and I just kept watching it. And I just couldn't even, I could not fucking believe my eyes. And then uh, a little bit before the show... I was putting something on my world famous Instagram, F4W Online, and uh, what comes up, I think it might have even been from Jericho, was footage of of the uh, of the giant swing. I'm pretty sure Jericho shared it. Yes, and uh, you know, like I said, this Isara was not afraid of heights, nope. clearly. No, nope. and if you watch it again, bro, a ring is twenty by twenty, right? Uh, is there's 20 by 20 or 18 by 18? We'll just say 20 by 20. All right. Makes the math easier. Okay. There were two rings. Mm-hmm. 20 by 40. Okay. Cage over both rings. All right. So what are we talking? 800 square feet? Uh, in fact, yes. Or more. Probably 1,000 square feet. Maybe a little, 1, little, little, square feet. 1,000 square feet. A little bit more because it's got to go on the outside. Yep. Yes, yeah. 1,000 fucking square feet. Okay. Mm-hmm. Does this guy go to the middle of this fucking cage to do this spin? Of the 1,000 square feet, about at least 850 were off to one side of him. Bro, this guy was right on the fucking edge of this goddamn cage. It wasn't so bad that Jericho's head was like over the edge of the cage every time, but it was pretty fucking close. He was within 10 feet. God, and I'm just thinking, fuck me. Imagine Jericho. Yeah. He's on his back. He's, he's just looking up. And you're just seeing the ceiling go like this, and you know you're fucking 25 fucking feet above the ground. Yeah. And this crazy guy is on the edge of the cage. Yeah. And of course, Cesaro's spinning this guy, and presumably he doesn't get dizzy 
Oh, he's totally out of his mind, and he does get dizzy, but he's fi- still figured he'd do it at the edge of the cage. This was the scariest goddamn thing I've ever seen where someone didn't actually get hurt. Yeah. And uh, that's pretty much what Jericho said in the Instagram post, by the way. <laughs> I mean, fuck. That I will never forget as long as I live. Claudio spinning the sky right there on the fucking edge of that cage. Ja! God, I can't even think about it now. Well, that uh, follows, by the way. Before Claudio even got up there, it was Jericho and Eddie. And Eddie was looking around at the floor. He had a big evil grin on his face. Of course, he wants to kill Jericho. Sammy Guevara goes up to save Jericho. It goes badly for him. And 24 years and one day after Mankind fell off the cell against The Undertaker, Sammy Guevara falls off the cell here against uh, Eddie Kingston. And unlike... Mankind, who went through a table with monitors on it and didn't tell anyone what he was going to do. They had a special landing thing, a table over a crash pad or something. So there was zero. Well, I shouldn't say zero. Vinny. There was a, a chance he wouldn't. As die. God yeah. is my witness, mm-hmm. I would go off the top of that cage mm-hmm. through that table and crash pad. Before taking the Giants. A million times. I was going to say a hundred, but it's literally a million. (laughs) A million times before I would let anybody give me a giant swing on top of that fucking cage right by the edge. A million times. Golly. Well, everyone lived. And so Eddie has Jericho down. And he cranks in that stretch plum. And he's going to make this guy submit. And he's going to get his revenge. And everything's going to be right with the world. But behind him, his teammate Claudio... Puts Daddy Magic in a sharpshooter. And these guys are cranking on these holds. And Jericho never taps, but Daddy Magic does. And Eddie's looking around like, what happened? And he knows he could have made Jericho quit, but he never got it. Now, there's a long-going storyline here. I'm sure we'll get more detail on this in weeks to come. But Kingston and Castagnoli have a long negative history. They do not like each other. And Eddie, after an initial uh, uh, dejection, the fact he was robbed of his dream of of tapping out Jericho because his teammate won for him, he made peace with it. They were bumping fists. He was not a totally happy camper, Eddie Kingston was, but his team won. He had survived to fight another day. So they were not at each other's throats, but there's more to come here. Man, when they did that finish and he had Jericho in the stretch plum and then right before Jericho could submit, Daddy Magic submitted. And like immediately my first thought was, what a fucking cop out. Like Jericho should have submitted for to Kingston. Like he was right there. And then, you know, Matt Menard. Like, I love the guy, but, you know, it's just like. But then when I saw who the two individuals involved were, mm-hmm. it was like. Oh yeah, that well, that, fucking you, finish was perfect. Finish, finish is absolutely perfect. You can still do Eddie and Jericho now. You yes, know, exactly. You do Eddie and Jericho. Yeah. You do Eddie and Cesaro. Eddie and Claudio can do. A, listen, Claudio. Yeah, they can, they can do. We we, we got to settle this one way or another. We got to get this done. Put it behind us. Then we can shake hands. You know what's fucking irritating is when Claudio went to WWE and he was Cesaro. I all I could ever think was Claudio Castagnoli. All it's just like that was always his name to me. Now he finally goes back to being Claudio Castagnoli. You know, I keep calling this fucking guy Cesaro. You're not the only one. Um, I know Jim Ross did, but there's also a Daniel Bryan. I thought it was uh, a Regal called him Daniel Bryan. There was a lot of voices. It was chaotic in the booth, too. Yeah. But there were name- many names gotten wrong. I heard a Cesaro, a Daniel Bryan, a Ruby Riot. That's the funny one, because as long as he was Ruby Riot, meaning of any mania for years. <laughs> Cesaro was Cesaro for a decade. Daniel Bryan was Daniel Bryan for like a decade. Ruby Riot was a thing for. Three years? Maybe. One year in the main roster? Anyway. Daniel Bryan. Uh, Ruby Riot. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, great great match. Great finish. Would have been better on pay-per-view. Very chaotic. Probably didn't need to go as long as it did. Probably didn't do this much crazy stuff when he couldn't see half of it anyway. But a thumbs up, for sure. The only thing, my only criticism of this match, and it has nothing to do with any of the wrestlers involved, was how in the world did they screw up that timing issue? When Jericho and Kingston and I can't remember who else was on top of the cage. Oh, it was uh, right before Sammy got thrown off. Yeah, like, it was Sammy. Yeah, it was all three of them were up there. Maybe the and table they're was literally not... all just laying there. I think because I, I heard there was shouting going on. Yeah, it was Jericho. He shouted down, "Are we on break?" Oh, that's so right. I okay. think they thought that it was a break. 
Gotcha. And then he's alerted it wasn't a break. Okay. And then they all jumped up and they threw Sammy off the cage. Oh, okay. Because they were just lying there doing nothing. I thought, like, someone had forgotten to prep the table. Like, inflate the table. No, 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 no. They and, and, And the weird thing was, you know, who was directing this in the sense that, because I'm sitting there and time is standing still as they're just laying there doing nothing. And I couldn't figure out why they were doing nothing until I heard Jericho ask if they were on break. But then my thought was, dude, there's three guys on top of the cage, which means there's eight guys and one guy who can't do anything. But there's eight active guys killing each other in the cages below. Why aren't you filming that right now? Why are you filming these guys not moving? I mean, that, that's what they did, so... I guess the director didn't want to miss it, presumably. But the wrestlers were confused. I don't know. It was weird. But, man, this match was awesome. This match was a great match. Like, you advertised blood and guts. Oh, you got blood and guts. And they fucking delivered blood and guts. You almost got guts. I'm sure somebody's intestines were hanging out when this is done. Yeah. yeah. And you know the other thing I want to mention? I said uh, briefly on Observer Live today. There's been one injury after another in AEW. They are cursed right now. And... You know, one of the first things people always say is, oh, it's the style. They're doing too much stuff. They should tone it down. Well, dude, we saw this match here, and literally, the one guy that hurt, that got hurt, delivered a urinage. A judo throw, yes. He didn't even take it. He <laughs> delivered it yeah. and tore every ligament in his knee. And I'm not defending, like, they do too much do too much stuff, and there are too many people getting injured, and the style is probably too hard. But I, my point is, shit happens in wrestling. Wrestling is dangerous. And yes. even if you eliminated all of the crazy shit they did in this match, a dude still did a urinage, and he blew out his knee. The one other thing I want to say before we move on is, uh, this show did over a million viewers, which is the first time in a long time they did over a million viewers. Did a .36 in 18-49, to 49, which is very, very good. And uh, I could not help but notice that for all of the talk about the women's audience and the, uh, you know, is it too much blood? Is it too much violence? The show was called Blood and Guts. If you watched it, you weren't expecting a clean show. It's called Blood and Guts. And they did big numbers in women. The women's audience was large. I think it was women 12 to 34. They beat everything else on cable. I mean, a show called Blood and Guts did not drive off women on this night. So I don't know what, I don't have a good theory, but I just wanted to point out that uh, if that's your theory, well, this show, uh, this show kind of uh, suggested otherwise. That was AEW. It sure was. Excellent show. Yes. Top to bottom. Uh, thumbs up show for AEW. Sangha versus Lee. Stands on Lee's chest when she's down. Bangs her uh, her on the apron. Pull, um, puts elbow on her chin. Threw her out of the ring. You know, it doesn't really matter a lot in 2022, Granny, but uh, yeah. Lee, in fact, identifies as a man. <laughs> Legend Dude, versus woman. Perez. That was another NXT. Can you believe the little guy beat him? He beat Legend. A little out. guy? It's now wrong. Roxanne Perez is a man? Yeah. Roxanne. <laughs> no. no, these were two women. <laughs> <laughs> you got to be kidding me, Granny. you got to be kidding me today. God. <laughs> if you enjoy these videos, for just $7.99 per month, you can enjoy full-length editions of The Brian and Vinny Show, Wrestling Observer Live, Figure Four Daily with Tom Lawler and Lance Storm, The Mad Men Podcast, Speak Now Pro Wrestling with Denise Salcedo and more, plus hundreds of archived shows, all in beautiful HD. Don't miss out. Join us today.